Well, good morning and welcome to the 30th meeting of the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee. And this morning I have apologies from committee members Richard Leonard and Alex Neal. Uh, may I remind everyone present to turn off any electrical devices that might interfere with the work of the committee. We have received apologies from Gordon MacDonald and we have two new committee members who replace Ash Denham and Gil Patterson. So I'd like to thank both Ash Denham and Gil Patterson for their work whilst on the committee. And the two new committee members are Colin Beatty and Tom Arthur. So I'll ask each of them, starting with Colin Beatty, to make the usual declaration of interest. Delighted to be on this committee. Um, I would simply uh, direct members to my um, register of interest. Thank you. And Tom Arthur. Thank you, convener, and good morning. Uh, likewise, I'm delighted to be on this committee. While I have no um, interest that I would regard as being required to declare, I would want to advise the committee that I'm a member of the Musicians' Union and I was formerly a company director. However, I no longer have any shares of interest in that company. Thank you. The first item on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed? No. Item eight. Are you sure? I think that's item eight. Um, wrong numbers here on the paper in front of me. Uh, thank you to the deputy convener for keeping us right on that. Um, are we agreed then that item eight should be taken in private? Yes. Good. Since we're agreed on that, we'll now turn to Scotland's economic performance, our current inquiry, and welcome our guests. This morning we have what's called a, a roundtable um, session, and uh, in the interest of hearing as much as possible from witnesses, I'd ask my fellow committee members to limit the length of their questions. If anyone, including our guests, want to come in, please just indicate by raising your hand and I can bring you in. As the discussion moves along, there's no need to switch on microphones. The sound desk will look after that. Um, so may I first of all start by uh, inviting each of uh, our guests. Perhaps it would be easier if I just um, name them. First of all, we have Professor Katia Montana, Chair of Economics at the University of Aberdeen with us. Welcome. Richard Marsh, who is Director for Consulting, who I think has been before the committee before. Um, Dr. Tanya Wilson of the University of Stirling, Dr. Alexandros Sangulaitis, I'm not sure if I have the pronunciation correct, but no doubt you can correct that, and Professor Julia Darby of the University of Strathclyde. Um, so perhaps I could start uh, going from my left and ask each of you simply to give a very brief or introduction from the point of view of the work that you do, your organization does. Um, start with Katia Montana. Yeah, I'm a professor of economics at the University of Aberdeen. Um, my work uh, focuses on issues related to globalization, international competitiveness, foreign direct investment. And uh, I work with a team of people in Aberdeen who work on, on related areas, uh, particularly on the interface between these issues and labor markets. Uh, I'm, as you said, a director of an independent economic consultancy based in Kokodi, and we work across uh, a broad range of clients and sectors, um, delivering research to help inform public sector investment decisions and private sector strategy. Uh, I'm Tanya Wilson. I'm a lecturer at the University of Stirling. I'm a labour economist. Uh, I specialise in the area of family economics and economics of the household, which includes uh, how households make decisions as to when to participate in the labour market and how much um, labour market activity that they would like to go and do co collectively. I'm uh, Dr. Uh, Alexandros Angelidis from the University of Aberdeen, Senior Lecturer in Economics. Uh, my research area are in labour economics and health economics. Primarily I, I worked on issues related to wage determination, labour supply and also issues related to economic inequality and issues related to socioeconomic uh, inequalities and the effect on health. I'm Julia Darby. I'm head of Department of Economics at Strathclyde, which is the home of the Fraser Allender Institute. So a lot of our work is connected with the Fraser, looking at productivity performance, labour market performance, and so on. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'll start with a, a general question to our guests. What would each of you say have been the main drivers of growth in the Scottish economy over the past 10 years, and how do you see these developing as we move forward into the next 10? I don't know who wants to come in first on that. Um, Richard Marsh. Come from the private sector, I'll just venture an opinion. Um, I think what I think this inquiry would, it would be helpful for it to do is rather than saying what's the one driver um, or what's, the, what's the, the, the barriers that have been holding us back, is to really think of it as, as there is no one single driver of Scotland's economy or of any economy. It's, it's dozens of different levers um, that we need to pull at different times in different ways and about projects and programmes delivered by a whole range of different actors at central, local government, private sector, public sector, colleges, universities. If we look at what's helped um, uh, you know, driving the growth in Scotland's economy, our exports have performed reasonably well, um, investment is continuing, we can continue to educate the workforce. There's, there's there's a whole range of different things nudging the economy forward. So if we think about what could we do better, we're not going to come out of today or even the end of the inquiry saying it's this one, two or three things. It'll be a whole range of things that we need to kind of tweak and adjust. Any other interested parties? <laughs> no further uh, comment on that. Um, Perhaps we can move on to John Mason, I think, as another area he'd yeah, like to raise. Quite a, quite a kind of wide question, so uh, maybe we can uh, folk can have some comments on that. The, the whole concept of how does Scotland's growth rate or how does Scotland compare with, A, the UK as a whole, B, other regions of the UK, because I think we realise that London is a bit uh, odd, and a, then other countries and other regions in the EU. And I mean, maybe you want to say... Who, which of these should we compare ourselves with? Or as Richard has kind of suggested, maybe we should just compare ourselves with everything, or does that get too complicated? So, I mean, how are we doing and what should we compare ourselves with? I think uh, we are all a bit shy. <laughs> um, well, I, I actually found it difficult looking at the at the questions to 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 structure answers in the sense that all these questions are pretty much interconnected. So to talk about, you know, how we do in comparison to others and talk about uh, how we measure uh, success and um, and what are the sectors or drivers of growth. I mean, all these things are very much related to an extent also to what are the reasons why growth has not has been as good as it could have been. So I think um, inevitably our answers will have to be crisscrossing the questions to some extent. I think one thing that, uh, to go back in part to what uh, Richard was saying that we, we could say is that the Scottish economy has not performed as well in the last few years as it could have done or, or, or as we would have hoped it to do. And, uh, and, there are, uh, and, the, and the, the, the key um, issue, therefore, is to try to understand why that has been the case. In terms of relative performance, it has performed probably in, in some dimensions better than the UK as a whole, in, in other dimensions worse than the UK as a whole. But uh, um, so recently there has been, for example, an increase in, in, uh, in growth and, and a catching up a little bit in, on productivity with respect to the UK as a whole. Um, but we are, um, you know, choosing the, the, the point of reference is important here because the UK as a whole has not performed that well. So if you compare uh, Scotland to similar countries of similar size, like, for example, you know, the small European countries, Norway, uh, Sweden, Finland, but also Eastern European countries, then you see that Scotland has not performed very well on many indicators. And I think that this is where the attention, perhaps, of, of the committee should, uh, should, should uh, go, to try to understand why there are these differences. Um, you know, in terms of uh, inequality, productivity, I'm sure these are all the aspects that will come up through the different headings. Um, the performance of Scotland has not been particularly good. Can I just say, ask, what, what you say performance, are, are we thinking primarily of GDP and GDP growth, or are you thinking of other things as well? Well, GDP, GDP per capita, for example, in Scotland, GDP per capita has been very stagnant. I think it has grown 
something in the region of 1% over 10 years. Um, GDP is not the best indicator of performance, and this GDP per capita is certainly not the best indicator of uh, income distribution, for example, but a performance of this level is, is pretty bad, even in the context of you know, a financial crisis. I mean, one thing which emerges by looking at the, at the data is that there is a very strong correlation between the degree of inequality in a country and the ability of the country to recover from the recession. So countries which have done better in that, uh, in that sense are countries which have a, a much lower inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient in Britain is very high compared to, uh, I think it is the, the, the worst performer in this respect after Latvia in, in Europe. Um, so all these things, you know, that's, that's one, of the, one of the issues, I think, that we have to decide how do we measure performance. There are different dimensions to performance. GDP is important. It's not the only measure. Uh, inequality is another dimension. But all these things need to be considered in a, in a more, you know, um, connected way, I guess. Thanks. Martin to come in, I think Professor Zangelik Lydis as well. So I just to, you were talking about Scotland in comparison to other um, similar sized countries. What what is it about those countries if they're performing better than than Scotland? What what, what mechanisms have they got in place that we don't that are driving that that improvement? Well, answering the question, I think requires. Um, answering an issue of causality. So, I mean, I mean answering the question requires um, analysis of, of the data, mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, um, some of these countries have got very different labor market institutions and welfare state systems. Um, and I am a firm believer that these are uh, policy dimensions which are very important in determining both the degree of um, equality within a country, but also the ability of a country to adjust and respond to shocks, to international shocks, for example. Um, so the provision of um, a safety net helps smoothening out the response to shocks, but uh, it has also very big, you know, very big long-term implications, like, for example, the incentives underpinning the acquisition of skills. So there is work which shows that um, certain labor market institutions favor the acquisition of firm or industry specific skills, which are important for productivity and the development of industry. Whereas a welfare state, um, which we would call the liberal welfare state uh, that the, the UK and other countries have, favors the acquisition of gener generic skills. So the worker, uh, in, in the face of uh, um, negative shocks, feels, you know, needs to self-insure, if you like, and, and, and the best way to do so is to acquire skill which, which uh, um, result in an easy, um, you know, you recycle yourself, you, mo you move across jobs more easily than if you acquire industry-specific skills. Mm. Uh, but then industry-specific skills are very important, for example, in manufacturing uh, and underpin uh, productivity in those sectors. So that's why I say, you know, it's important to to take a, a multidimensional view of performance, but also a multidimensional view of policy. I mean, policy areas are very much interconnected, and it is important to try to understand, but in an evidence-based manner, what these connections are. So certain policy decisions can be made in Hollywood, but certain policy decisions that uh, have an impact on, on our economy are made elsewhere, made, absolutely. Uh, made elsewhere. Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yes, Professor. Just to, um, to, uh, to highlight three points, I would uh, echo what uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Montagna, uh, said before. And, and I think it's important, you know, I think it's important to understand that there won't be a single answer. In an ideal world, yes, it would be nice to have one single answer to the, all those questions. But the reality is that the, the situation is, is uh, more complex. We need to understand the history, um, what the, uh, the economy, the British economy and the Scottish economy went through uh, the last 10 years in light of the Great Recession, uh, the vote for, uh, for Brexit, and what and the implications that had for the overall economy, uh, consumer confidence, uh, the labor market. Um, as my colleague also said, we shouldn't be looking only at a single uh, indicator when we talk about, for instance, productivity or inequality. There are many things. And also, we need to be very cautious because behind uh, single measures, there is a lot of hidden information. So, for instance, if we look about, uh, if we look on unemployment, unemployment, admittedly, the last years has improved, 
but behind that there is the big issue of underemployment. So there are many people on part-time contracts, temporary contracts, on zero contract hours. So, so one could say that, well, actually, the labor market, the situation in the labor market hasn't necessarily improved. Uh, so we need to be very cautious about that. And the last point, going back to your question, I think uh, I totally agree with, uh, with um, uh, Professor Montagna's position, again, that uh, one key uh, part is the institutions, the labor market institutions in operation, um, but also the overall uh, regulatory environment and whether there is scope for the government to intervene more, more uh, to the markets, uh, the goods market, uh, the labor market, the financial market, and have a more um, uh, active approach to those. John Mason, did, 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 did you want to come back on that at all? Or? Well, leave it just now and I'll come back in later. Maybe. All right. yep. um, we can move on perhaps to something Colin Beatty wanted to uh, have a discussion about. Thank you, Mayor. I'd really like to ask a sort of two-part question. The population of Scotland has been increasing. The population of the rest of the UK appears to be increasing at a much higher rate, partly driven by higher rates of, of immigration. What impact does that have on GDP and calculation of GDP relative to each uh, each market. Richard, Just make a simple point. If if you've got a growing population, it's more likely your economy will grow more quickly because you'll need to spend more money on public services. Um, those people are more likely to have jobs, so they'll spend their money on the high street, and that will create economic activity. So. Countries where the population is growing more quickly tend to have a slightly higher rate of economic growth. But I think as a number of people around the table have said already, perhaps a slightly more important measure is, can, is, is the level of wages, the quality of life and the GDP per capita. So if your population is growing, you want the economy ideally to be growing slightly ahead of your population growth in order to make sure you can deliver a real growth in, in wages to the people living here. So would it be correct to say that some of the GDP difference would be based really on population. Absolutely. Let me ask the second part of the question, which is really about uh, future growth. Where do you see the future growth coming from in the economy in Scotland? Is it going to be export driven? Is it going to be from any particular sector in the market? Who's the yes. expert on this? Professor Darby. Um. So a lot of the growth in jobs has been around certain cities. So um, we have quite big differentials in productivity between cities. You talked about London being a bit different, but both Edinburgh and Glasgow have better headline statistics on GVA per head than many of the other, than the other cities, the other big cities in the UK. But Dundee is right at the other end on having poor GVA and a lower skilled labour force on average. So um, at the moment, it looks like there's job growth concentrated on the well-performing cities and the recovery of employment in Glasgow has been quite big. We don't know quite so much about the, the, the nature of the jobs that have increased as we would like, but around Glasgow and Edinburgh, employment has been much stronger than around some other parts of Scotland. And if you go to North Ayrshire, you have a very different picture of a lack of recovery that, in, in jobs. Is that because of the nature of the economic activity within these regions, or is it some other factor? It looks like the concentration of activity has become more city-centric. What does that hold for the future? Well. We need to know more about the types of jobs that are in there to some degree, because uh, I think one of the submissions was talking about mismatch and talking about people in graduates in non-graduate jobs and so, so on, that kind of mismatch. One thing that we don't know enough about at the moment is the extent to which the new jobs, uh, jobs which are not bringing out the efficiency of the workers as much as we would like. So there is a possibility that we still need to have quite a shakeout from some of the jobs that were the jobs available to the jobs that are going to be high growth jobs. And that push needs more of a recovery. 
Does anyone else have a view on that? Uh, I would say that talking about the future or you know guessing what may happen in the future re requires resolving a number of uncertainties that we are facing at the moment. So there, are, there is a big uncertainty, for example, about the price of oil. I mean, one of the, the key sectors which has led growth in Scotland in the last uh, decade or, or, or beyond is uh, the oil sector, but we don't know. Because a lot of this uncertainty is political in nature, so it's very difficult to to, to guess. The, the other big uh, issue uh, of uncertainty is Brexit. So it's it's not easy to understand. Um, I mean, at the moment, the, the state of play is, uh, is still very uh, undetermined, and it's, it's not easy to, to understand what the impact of, of Brexit may be on, on sectors. The other big uh, um, factor determining the, the future development of the economy is, uh, is actually investment. Uh, and that, in turn, may depend on the outlook of firms, which in turn depends on the, the state of the overall economy. So at the moment, what we have, uh, and somebody has mentioned it already, what, what we have uh, observed is a, a consumer-led growth, um, which, which has been funded essentially by the saving by consumers. And uh, the, the country has, has experienced one of the, the biggest devaluations in history as a result of the referendum, but it hasn't translated into an improvement of the trade balance or an increase in exports, and certainly not. Th there isn't any evidence of a rebalancing of the economy towards manufacturing. And, and the reason for that is, um, uh, well, there may be many reasons, but certainly one reason for that is the fact that investment is, is very flat, if not, if not falling. Um, so again, that requires, you know, going back to why this is so. You know, what is the, uh, what are the the drivers of uh, of firms' decision at the moment? We have had, you know, a decade of very low interest rates, uh, fairly weak pound, and uh, therefore that we should we should favour exports, and the structure of the economy is such that uh, a very small percentage of firms export. There are some sectors which are at the, front, at, at the technological frontier, but the, the economy is characterized in Scotland and in the UK by a, a high degree of dualism with um, you know, some small pockets of activity which are ge geographically concentrated and sectorally concentrated and which are at the frontier of the, uh, the, te the technological frontier, high productivity sectors, but they employ a fairly small number of, of people. So the majority of um, labor uh, creation, employment creation, is actually occurring in sectors which are low productivity sectors. I'd like to bring in Professor Zangelides and Dr. Wilson. I, I agree with uh, both um, the previous position. I think, positions. I think another issue that um, is not only which industry is going to pr uh, bring uh, growth for the, uh, for the Scots economy, but also what type of uh, uh, business uh, uh, will facilitate that. I mean, if we look at uh, across the, the Scots economy, a large share of uh, businesses are small, medium enterprises. So we need to think about that. And if you think about also the geography of Scotland, uh, how, can, can, how can we facilitate a sustainable growth for those small, medium enterprises? We need support uh, innovation, entrepreneurship. We need to think about the, um, the type of ownership. Uh, there were some interesting... Um, uh, reports submitted for this committee uh, related to cooperatives, employee-owned uh, companies. I think there is a lot of uh, scope for, uh, for this committee to investigate further about that. There is a lot of literature on um, cooperatives and um, the productivity effects they have, uh, the effects they have on uh, employees' behavior, uh, both in terms of productivity, productivity in, ter in terms of turnover, in terms of absenteeism, so there are many positive effects uh, that those firms uh, have. So I think you know that could be uh, one way forward for this committee to explore not only the, uh, the particular sectors but also the business models that can facilitate uh, future future growth, not only as an avenue for growth but also as a way to uh, alleviate inequalities in the labour market. Uh, alleviate the, uh, or at least uh, deal to some extent with uh, the gender pay gap, providing an opportunity for the younger people who are the younger people and female individuals who are more adverse affected by the, uh, the, the decentralization to go back to the labor market and engage in, in more meaningful uh, career pathways.
to return to the Professor Darby's po point. Uh, so within my submission, I did some analysis by uh, employment shares across industries. Um, and my apologies, it seems that the, uh, the figures were very, very small and may not have been discernible. Um, so within Scotland, the most important sectors in terms of employment are wholesale and resale trade. However, this has been declining over time. It's also been declining uh, in the UK as a whole. Um, the rate of, rate of uh, decline seems to be broadly similar between the UK and Scotland. And um, the other very important sector uh, that employs up to 15% of the total workforce is human health and social care. And this is increasing over time, and this is probably due to, well, I would imagine this is due to the demographics of Scotland. We have an, an ageing population. Um, I cannot talk about uh, regional differences, because that's not something that I looked at. But a, a question uh, that the committee might want to go and consider is, if we look at the trends in employment by sector, um, there's a question of, do you want to focus e uh, efforts on declining sectors to perhaps rejuvenate sectors? So, for instance, uh, Professor Montagna talked about manufacturing. Manufacturing has been declining. It's been declining for far longer than the past decade. Do we, uh, is is um, a focus needed on trying to rejuvenate cons um, manufacturing and, to a certain extent, construction, or to focus on those sectors that are already increasing and uh, already becoming more important over time. Thank you. And I think Richard Marsh wanted to come in and Julian Martin with a, a brief point. Richard Marsh. Very briefly, just to go back to, I think, the original question asked by Colin Beatty to say who's the expert on what the future sectors will be. No one. There, there are no experts on what the future sectors are going to be the winning sectors for. If anyone claims they are an expert and will tell you what the future sectors will be, hurl them onto the streets and do not listen to them. Um, you know, in, in Scotland, we, we have, had, have a mixed track record in picking the sectors of the future. And we have a graveyard of Silicon Glen. We have other sectors that we've said these are the key sectors, these are the growth sectors. We chop and change them over time, and they tend to not perform as well as we hope they might. Where is the economic growth going to come from? Take it wherever you can get it. So just whatever growth comes our way, welcome it. Let the businesses who decide to come into Scotland to grow their businesses in Scotland, to invest in Scotland, listen to what they want and let there be growth from, from sources that maybe we're actually not even thinking about that haven't been talked about in public forums to date. Um, the comment about the... Uh non-existence of economic profits, I think, has uh, raised a bit of interest. So Julian Martin, uh, Professor Darby, then Dean Lockhart, Tom Arthur and John Mason all wanted to come in. So perhaps in that roughly order, we'll, we'll move to Julian Martin and then Professor Darby. What's been, been brought up about business models is really important. And it sort of, when, when uh, uh, Dr Zangledis was mentioning that, it inform my next question, which is around policy decisions. And I, I, I think I'm going to direct this to, to uh, Dr Wilson, because I know that you, you mentioned in your introduction you look at family economics. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to know, just off the back, um, the back of uh, recent policy decisions, both UK policy decisions and Scottish government policy decisions, which have got the most potential to improve productivity and the family situation, and which also, conversely, have got the, the potential to have a negative impact on uh, the family. Um, so one of, the th uh, one of the policy decisions which I think is uh, incredibly welcome in Scotland has been the increase in childcare provision for young families. So we, we, we can see in the data that having young children in the household can um, impact that decision whether or not to be able to, uh, to work or to be able to work the number of hours that someone wishes to work. So um, this there is a gender divide. This impact generally impacts women more than men, but it's not that, you know, it, it, it's across the board. And I think the the, the fairly recent um, the fairly recent increase uh, in the provision of uh, childcare will allow uh, 
those individuals who want to either return to the uh, return to the workforce earlier than they previously would have done, um, and also perhaps work longer um, than they previously would have been able to do. So I think that's been a that's a welcome policy move. Um, bringing in business models, we've mentioned business models have to be able to fit around that as well in order to increase product productivity in general. So when you talk, you mentioned, Dr. Sangalid has mentioned business models. If, it'd be good to get an example of what you'd see a business model should be to encourage more people to enter the workforce. Um, so if I've understood you correct, uh, your question correctly, uh, so a business model that is built around flexible working and um, allowing or, or facilitating a, a worker to go and juggle their many commitments. Um, again, within the data, it's uh, see that there is a uh, there, there is a proportion of people who say that they would like to go and work longer hours, but they can't because of family commitments, um, which would generally would be childcare commitments. So uh, having uh, more flexible working practices in many businesses, that allowing individuals to go and work potentially uh, starting earlier, finishing earlier in order to go and be able to go and uh, look, look after the children may help there. Okay, um, Professor Darby, then Professor Zangulides, and then our, my fellow committee members, perhaps. So I think we'd all agree with Richard that it's damn difficult to sit here and try and pick where the growth is going to come from. But we can get quite a lot by going back to the LSE Growth Commission and its most recent recommendations in that they're talking about not concentrating so much on the frontier, but looking beneath that at the productivity growth of the second, third and fourth quartiles. And if you can move those up, you can do an awful lot to close the gap that's opened up to pass trends in productivity. So they, they talk quite a bit about how you might go about that, and they've done a lot of studies for a lot of countries on how efficiency improvements at the company level can make big gains, and it's scratching definitely beneath the surface of the aggregate figures. But the sort of work that they're talking about, they talk about matching firms to higher productivity firms and sharing best practice. And they talk about what might be in it for the best performing firms and what might be in it is that they get an improved supply chain. But there might also be something government can do to incentivise that as well. But by focusing on the frontier and trying to pick winners, you're almost bound to spend a lot of money and get some of it wrong. Whereas if you look at beneath that and how you can move people up towards the frontier and what's stopping them getting up there, then you can make bigger gains at the aggregate level. Um, Professor Zangelides. Yes, thank you. Uh, just to add something to, uh, to the points, the, the value points that uh, uh, Dr. Tanya Wilson uh, raised before regarding uh, flexible uh, working arrangements, I think it's important to, to understand the uh, complexities uh, of um, trying to keep a, a work-life balance, especially for the uh, um, female individuals, for the women. So, but what we also need to acknowledge here is that there is a bias towards these um, types of arrangements. And the often in the labor market, uh, you know, individuals who are uh, in uh, part-time or temporary uh, contracts, especially part-time contracts, are regarded as more inferior and they're not given uh, the same opportunities in terms of their career development, training, uh, career progression. So, so there needs to be a change in the culture as well to accommodate that. So it's not only about providing flexible working arrangements, but it's also recognizing uh, how valid they are, uh, their contribution to the economy, and providing the necessary, if you want, regulatory framework to support them and not treat them as, as they are currently treated, as something uh, inferior. Thank you. Um, we'll perhaps take points from Dean Lockhart and Tom Arthur and then discussion and move on to other committee members. My, my question is about the role of policy, specifically the, the UK industrial strategy, which uh, the white paper will be published, uh, I believe, quite shortly. Now, I don't think um, it will look like the, the 1970s version of a, an industrial strategy, which was about picking winners. This is more about sector deals, collaboration, city deals, increasing innovation. So I wonder if I could ask uh, some of our guests, when it comes to looking at Scotland and how that industrial strategy can help 
Uh, and it might cover things like business models, because it's a very wide-ranging um, policy. I wonder if you were to identify some priority areas for Scotland where the, um, the industrial strategy could, could help boost the economy or productivity or innovation levels. And Tom Arthur, perhaps, and then I'll, we'll throw it open to discussion for the panel members. Thank you, Convener. It was actually a supplementary to a point um, raised by Richard Marsh. I think we probably all agreed that picking winners is a risky business, but uh, it does lead to corollary. What about those sectors that are in decline? What about those areas that perhaps are particularly exposed to innovation, be it AI, robotics? Um, what sectors do our um, panellists think we, we are perhaps overexposed to? Um, that we have to be on guard and we have to start planning ahead and thinking about reskilling and retooling. Um, and how do we... Well, I'm quite keen to gauge uh, members' views on some of, uh, in, in the existing forecasts, which range from we will muddle along and be fine to fairly apocalyptic with 40% unemployment. So I'm keen to get a sense of where people think a happy median is and equally how we um, work towards and how we accommodate the changes that will be brought on by innovation. And can we identify sectors that may not be winners but will be losers in the long term? Professor Montana. Again, this would require having a crystal ball to some extent. I, th I think uh, there are a number of, of issues. But, but, uh, um, no, start from the beginning. I, I think a key issue here is productivity, okay? And, and that, that should be at the core of any industrial strategy. And productivity, you know, it is very easy in abstract to think of what are the key factors determining productivity. Everybody can name them, uh, you know, infrastructure, skills, and whatever. But I think a, a deep understanding of productivity requires actually to be evidence-based because uh, uh, different sectors, different regions, different firms um, will have different reasons behind a poor or, or a successful productivity performance. Now, I go back to something that Professor Darby was talking uh, uh, earlier, the, the LSE productivity report. At the core of that uh, research is really the idea that the, the, the profile, uh, the size and productivity distribution of industries is very important in determining aggregate productivity. And this is something actually we discussed here in the context of the data uh, inquiry. Um, now, uh, one interesting stylized fact is that it is true that uh, Scotland is made up primarily of small and medium enterprises, and, and we know that there is a positive correlation between the size distribution and productivity distribution of firms and the aggregate productivity. But uh, um, Scotland doesn't, doesn't score badly with respect to the rest of the UK in that dimension. So it has, for example, although 64% of, of new firms in Scotland are zero employee firms, this percentage is lower than in the rest of the UK. The percentage of bigger firms, uh, as, as in 250 employees and above, is bigger in Scotland than in the rest of the UK. And yet the productivity performance in Scotland has been worse. So it's important to understand why this link, which is there in the aggregate, but it, it, you know, it kind, kind of breaks down when you do a comparison between Scotland and the rest of the UK, uh, is breaking down. So what, what is that makes the productivity profile of firms not translate into a better aggregate productivity performance. Similarly, uh, I, I'm doing some work with a, a PhD student and a colleague in, in Aberdeen about the uh, effects of firm uh, characteristics on mismatch. We know that Scotland has uh, a higher problem in skill mismatching. You know, firms in Scotland have a greater difficulty than uh, in the rest of the UK in finding the right skills, and yet you know, the, the, the profile of firms in Scotland, if anything, is better than in the rest of the UK. So that takes us, you know, to, to, to really, I, I, I talked about productivity as a, a, a process akin to peeling an onion last time. I mean, this is, the, this is the key issue. We need to understand what lies at the core of the onion. We need to understand what is uh, the root cause of the productivity problems that the, that the country has. And that requires evidence-based uh, analysis. Uh, personally, I think that um, there may well be a Scottish factor, uh, uh, that is to say, you know, something which has to do with the, 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 the region, uh, the characteristics of industries, the, 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 the fact that the industries in Scotland may perhaps not be as large as in other parts of the UK, so there could be a scale factor. 
what Marshall called external economies, no? So the, 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 the productivity of individual firms depend on the productivity of the sector. The existence or not of clusters, uh, industrial clusters, which play a role, uh, as we know, in facilitating uh, growth of individual firms. So these are all things which require a deep understanding of the issues. And what I, I think would be a good suggestion, actually, is to set up a, a productivity commission in Scotland to try to look at, at these things. Right. Uh, Dr. Wilson and then Richard Marsh. Um, so just to go in and pick up on the point of Mr. Arthur about um, the implications of, of growth in different sectors, um, there's been a lot of talk recently about the impact of automation um, and how th this is expected to go and be, be fantastic for productivity, but may not actually be as fantastic for employment. So there's some rumours that the Chancellor will be talking about this and the budget in, in so far as of uh, putting in investment into, for instance, driverless cars. Um, and I was reading this week that by 2021, we're expecting that we'll be having our first driverless cars. And that sounds in one way fantastic that we're moving forward but there's over a million individuals within the uk who are employed as drivers and if that change happens and that change happens incredibly quickly then uh, the question is well um it's a question of rescaling and the question of which sectors would they partic partic uh, potentially go into. So there has been a wild claims on this. So I've, I've seen papers that have said that as much as 40% of jobs will disappear within the next um, 20 years. Um, one recently said that 4 million jobs within the private sector in the UK will, will go within the next 10 years. Um, I think what's important to understand it, that's it doesn't that may mean that four jobs that four million jobs that currently exist may be able to be done by robotics or by automation but history has told us that other jobs in other sectors will arise and become more important however it takes time and it takes time to reskill so uh, for those individuals who are affected by automation it may be extremely difficult for them to acquire skills in different areas and which skills should they acquire in order to be able to to uh, get these new jobs that we don't even know what they would be at this point richard marsh um it's hugely interesting that the topics that everyone's touched on today. Um, I think the point raised by Tom Arthur is a fantastic one. I'm just thinking it chimes with what Professor Darby said at the beginning. We've got parts of Scotland, um, like the big cities, Edinburgh and Glasgow, that are doing quite well. And we've got parts of Scotland, um, like North, I think you mentioned North Asia, um, that are doing not so well. And that chimes back to, I suppose, any economics 101 textbook, I'll put this to the academics here, any economics 101 textbook in Scotland will talk about, in the first few pages, the trade-off between efficiency and equity. In Scotland, we currently have an economic strategy which talks about equality significantly. And at the heart of it says, if we improve equality, we raise economic growth, and we raise economic growth in a specific way. We help equality. I think that, whilst I don't disagree with that, it, it almost tries to rewire that basic lesson of economics, to say there are significant trade-offs in identifying who are the losers from the trends that are unfolding in Scotland, identifying the big winners like Edinburgh and Glasgow, and those that are struggling, like, like North Asia, and putting a very stark choice in front of us to say, if we want to focus our resources where we'll generate more growth, it could well be we focus on the cities of Edinburgh and Glasgow. It could be if we want to try and mitigate some of the negative consequences of these trends, we focus a bit more on North Asia, or we actually, as you've suggested, identify some of those that might lose from some of the trends are unfolding and say, well, what support mechanisms can we put in place? You try and do both. You try and generate economic growth and you try and mitigate some of the negative consequences from the trends unfolding in Scotland. 
But there are choices to be made to say we have limited resources and we need to try and focus best where we can generate growth and focus resources where we can try and help improve equality. But I think it makes me slightly nervous if we say we're going down a track to say by doing all of these things we will naturally raise economic growth. We have to make quite stark choices about where we put the resources. And for when we're dealing with issues like our enterprise agencies, sometimes their mission of raising economic growth has sometimes been muddled. Muddled in what way? Muddled in the way, um, I think there's a, there was a, a very good paper produced by uh, Professor Richard Harris. I think it was evaluating regional selective assistance. I think it was regional selective assistance, but it said it was, it was a good tool um, for safeguarding employment, but it was less of an effective tool in terms of raising productivity. I think that comes back to, to, to the point you're making. We know there will be um, certain parts of Scotland, certain sectors within Scotland that will be struggling in the face of global um, movements that we might want to say we need to safeguard jobs or we need to move jobs into areas in Scotland that are more deprived. Now, that might come at a slightly higher cost than if we wanted to put them into more affluent parts of Scotland. And that's a choice we have to think very carefully about. Um, Professor Sangelaidis. I think I can understand what, uh, where uh, Richard is, uh, is coming from and, you know, the points that he raised. But I think it's important that, you know, we're talking about uh, sustainable growth and balanced growth uh, because, you know, focusing again on single indicators and looking at the average, what's happening at the average of Scotland hides or potentially can hide a lot of heterogeneity. And I think we should, we should be very cautious and I, I would adopt a different approach of a more balanced growth. There are definitely areas that can drive growth. Uh, we've seen that before. But I think we should be very careful, and that shouldn't be done at the expense of uh, more remote areas or uh, urban areas, because you need to think about, we need to think about how Scotland will evolve, the, uh, given the geography and the socioeconomic composition and the demographic composition in the next 10, 15, 20 years, and what we want uh, to happen. So we, we need to be, my, my, my view would be, we need to be very cautious and not look at uh, single indicators or what happens on average. We need to look at, you know, different segments of the society and different uh, areas and how sustainable growth will be for them as well. Thank you. And, uh, I think um, committee members Andy Whiteman and Jamie Halcourt Johnson had questions that relate to the areas that some of our witnesses have just covered. So perhaps Andy Whiteman and then Jamie Halcourt Johnson. Yeah, just sort of three questions to throw into the mix. Um, there's been some talk about not picking winners, and broadly I think most politicians agree that that's not a, a valid strategy. But would, would um, our, our friends here agree that, I mean, there are sectors that we will always need. We need food, we need health, we need shelter, we need warmth, we need energy. Um, and that there are broad sectors where we need to move away from, like fossil fuels, we need to decarbonise the economy. So there are clear drivers to the sectors that we need to at least make sure are going to be um, uh, in, a, in a good place in future. That's our first point. The second question is, how, how important is kind of savings and, and debt ratios? I mean, Britain at the moment has got very, very high levels of personal debt, and a lot of that personal debt goes into consumption um, and is, in fact, behind a lot of the GDP uh, growth. So what, what's the importance of that? I'll come back to the third one later, because it's maybe... A bit different. Perhaps. Uh, I think John Mason wants to add a top up to that if he, he might. And uh, we'll, we'll perhaps throw this over to the panel before we come to Jamie's. Yes, okay, to top up uh, to what Andy White just said and what uh, Mr. Marsh said earlier on about, uh, you know, we, we seem to be accepting that we can't pick winners. And yet Andy's just made the point that there are certain sectors. And I mean, I'm looking at back then at something like decommissioning. Now, we appear to have missed the boat, or at least we're behind the curve on decommissioning uh, oil rigs and such like compared to other countries. Now, surely that was something that we should have seen coming. I, and I don't know why we didn't see it coming, or maybe I'm misunderstanding, maybe uh, we did, but all these oil rigs seem to be going somewhere else. So, I mean, taking an example like that, 
you know, are we just not good at picking winners? Because surely we have that was something that was predictable and we could have picked it. Uh, Professor Mondana. On the, on the picking uh, the winners, I think in a knowledge economy, increasingly comparative advantage is something which is man-made. It doesn't necessarily only rely on uh, natural resources. So the, the, you know, the, the, the role of uh, policy in uh, facilitating the emergence of industry uh, and, and new sectors is actually very, uh, very much a possibility. And uh, so I certainly I, I would uh, agree that um, the, the, all the clean energy sector is one where um, a lot can be done, and, and, and Scotland is already uh, in a good position there, but it could be, you know, it could be better, yeah? It could, it could do better. Um, the issue of uh, saving and debt is a big issue because um, the, the, you know, the country, the, Essentially, the financial crisis has resulted in an aggregate demand deficiency, and, and what has led growth, or the little growth that we have had in, in the UK in the last 10 years, is, is, is consumption. And, uh, and, um, and that uh, is a problem, and, and I think I, I go back to the big issue of productivity. I think what needs to, what needs to be addressed is the investment side, uh, which in turn would, would facilitate a more export-oriented uh, type of growth which we, we, we are not having because uh, of, of lack of, of productivity. Um, so, yeah, I, I lost uh, track of what uh, I wanted to add. I'll stop perhaps, here now. <laughs> thank you. Perhaps Richard Marsh wants to pick up there. It, it was just to pick up on the specific point that, that John Mason and, and Andrew Whiteman raised uh, about decommissioning and, and, and the renewables industry and so on. I actually think that's probably right. Where, where we've been lousy in the past, it's about making specific projections about where we're going to be in 20, 30 years' time. We're not terribly great at that, but no one is. But it could, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. We can make broad uh, assumptions about where things are going, think, well, what if household debt evolves in the following ways? Or what if we move more quickly away from fossil fuels? Absolutely, we can do those kind of broad projections. We're talking so far in quite an abstract way um, about some of these issues. With, with the issue around decommissioning, I, I think I can share some of your concerns around kind of ha have we kind of missed the boat a bit? And you think about the resources we had at our command, the assets we had, we probably should have been better positioned than we were. Thinking about the recent um, issues around BIFAB, which is fairly close to, 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 to to, to my base of operations, so I'm reasonably familiar with it. We've got a situation where we have a company that's um, involved in the kind of industries we've just been talking about, and within uh, around an hour's drive of Burnt Island, we have uh, there's five docks. The Tay plan sets out that Dundee and Montrose harbours will be invested in to take advantage of the renewables industry and decommissioning. City of Edinburgh Council's economic strategy says they're going to develop Leith Docks, take into account renewables. Fife Council developed the energy park at Methyl to deal with renewables. And we have a company that's actually involved in it who's struggling um, in Burnt Island in the renewables industry. We're not so great at the execution of these plans particularly when it comes to local areas. Within an hour's drive for that company that, that has been struggling, we have five locations all trying to do the thing, same thing, all supported by public money. We have too much of this going on at a local level. We're not actually really competing internationally. They're competing with one another. And we often talk within the enterprise networks and the local level of how we come together as Scotland PLC. There is no Scotland PLC in that sense. If there were, and this were an arm of a company, and we had five sites all doing similar things, and a struggling arm at that, it would be, well, which do we close? Where do we concentrate our resources? How do we collaborate more and bring up, draw ourselves in? But we don't have that conversation. So part of this has to be about taking these quite sensible assumptions about where we're going to be going, 
but implementing that in a far more focused way at a local level. Dr. Wilson. If I can return to a specific point that Mr. Whiteman made. So, um, as I understand it, Mr. Whiteman was making the point that um, we may gaze into our crystal balls and try and look at those sect sectors that will be become more important in the future, but we already know that there are going to go and be sectors that are always going to be important, such as food, health and shelter, as he was saying. So something that I was... Re uh, I, I do feel that, that we can learn something from the international contacts. So I was reading recently that the Netherlands has overtaken Spain as the larger, largest producer of tomatoes in the EU. And they use a technology whereby what's important is, is having energy in order to go and create artificial sunlight and a lot of water. Now, so something that I think Scotland has is a lot of water and we have the ability to go and generate uh, fossil fuel free types of energy. I mean, this, I mean, look, I, I don't know enough about the case of the Netherlands, but like, you know, this is the type of industry that you think, okay, well, that's actually potentially one way that, uh, that Scotland, through our geography and through our, have, we have a comparative advantage in compared to other countries, and this could be, um, a type of sector. And then you, you also raised, raised another point regarding uh, the importance of savings and debts um, and the extent to which demand is driven by consumer choices and if this is driven by debts. Um, and that, of course, is a very, very important important question. We saw, uh, like, you know, uh, if, if consumption is driven by... By, through debts rather than through incomes, then it means that the, the economy is obviously open to more adverse shocks. If, if there's a global shock, it means that people are going to go and tighten their belts, stop spending, which is exactly what happened in, in the last recession. So really uh, uh, a movement towards increased growth through increased incomes and spending rather than through increased debt collection. Thank you. Um, just to follow up, yes, I mean, I, my, my third question was going to be about, in terms of um, household income, which is important in the economy, um, with historically in Britain, you know, very high house prices, very high housing costs, both um, in debt and rent, what, um, what role does reducing household costs play in improving the performance of an economy, or is it really just swings and roundabouts? So if, for example, housing costs as a target are kept down to 20% of average incomes, um, is that good for the economy? Um, or is it not? Because obviously those people that are receiving those flows of funds from high levels of housing costs are no longer receiving them. So, so what role does reducing household costs play and increasing disposable income play in improving economic performance? I guess in a situation where household incomes have been uh, falling, then reducing household costs is, is, uh, is helpful. Um, but, but, but the key point about the, you know, the, the, the saving issue is, is not simply that people are spending money because you know, they want to, they are, they are the saving because they do not have income. So you know, they are increasingly, there are people who f finding a job is not, is not necessarily a way out of poverty, right? And, this, and we go back to, to the point that we discussed earlier about the great degree of economic insecurity which characterizes current labor markets. So the, the, the majority of the jobs which have been created uh, in the last few years are either self-employed job, and we are not talking about uh, Rockefeller self-employed, we are talking about zero employee firms, we are talking about you know, uh, people really um, uh, not necessarily making much of their, of their enterprise. We are talking about uh, temporary jobs. It's true that some people uh, opt for a temporary job because it gives them flexibility, but there is also evidence which suggests that about 30% of those who are on a temporary job would like to work longer. So these are you know, technically underemployed. Uh, and then those who are uh, maybe working full-time are working on, on very, uh, uncer in very, on very uncertain terms. So this links up again to, to the issue of automation. Automation 
is often used as an excuse to justify this type of contracts, but I think it is important that we understand that, you know, at the end of the day, we need to take a kind of general equilibrium view of the economy, no? Um, if, if, if incomes are, are too low, there isn't enough aggregate demand, there isn't, there, there isn't a, a, a market for firms, so nobody wins. And, and that's why it is important to address uh, the problem of uh, the way in which the labor market works. Flexible labor markets don't necessarily lead to a better allocation of resources if they underpin a deficiency in aggregate demand. And that's where then institutional arrangements are important and, uh, and perhaps even business models or, or uh, like the cooperatives. I mean, what we, what we are observing now is a situation where um, as never before uh, in, in, in the modern capitalist hist uh, history of the capitalist world, we have had um, a reallocation of risk away from firms towards workers. And I, dis I think that this is a key point which needs to be addressed. Uh, Professor Darwin, Professor Zangelaitis. I think the increase in, in work poverty means that housing affordability is a huge issue for some part of the population. I think there's also an element that there's a generational thing going on here that we've had a decade now of slow income growth and the ability for people entering the labour market during that period to save, to have the income to save, to build up wealth has just not been there the way it has in the past. And the optimism about where your future earnings are going to go for the people that haven't experienced that kind of growth in the past is very different. So the increase in unsecured consumer credit that's concentrated around the relatively young and those in work in poverty is a worrying feature and action that can help them is very worthwhile on affordability of housing and so on. But it's, it's a very mixed picture. There are people that are doing okay and there are people that are really struggling. Yes, uh, I would agree with uh, both uh, previous uh, speakers. I think they, they highlight some important issues. Reducing housing costs definitely would, uh, would help, but I would, I would say that also increasing household um, uh, income would help e e even more. And what we've seen the last uh, uh, 10 years is, as the previous uh, speaker said, uh, increasing work po poverty, uh, flexible contracts that are uh, involuntary flexible contracts and part-time arrangements. Uh, we have seen a reduction in uh, real wages. Uh, household income has, uh, has been reduced. And what we've also seen, which is related to the evidence that I submitted, uh, the returns to education. Education still pays a premium, but that premium has almost halved if you look at the, year, the, the returns to years of education. And if you look at, uh, the same goes if you look at qualifications. The qualification premium, the premium of having a university degree has reduced in the last 10 years. And that goes back to, it has implications for household income, it has implications about the future uh, in terms of uh, growth, how competitive the Scottish labour market uh, will be in the years to come, especially in light of the, the labour market uncertainties that the Great Recession has created, uh, the prospect of, uh, of Brexit and what could be the, uh, the new uh, working arrangements. So, so we need to look at those issues and we need to see how it has affected income inequality, how is it, it has affected the average household, but also what could be the projections uh, to the future and how competitive the, the Scottish economy is going to be, but also how uh, equitable the distribution of income will be in Scotland. May I just um, follow up on the, some of the points you made there? Um, if 30 years ago only 5% of the Scottish population went to university and had a university degree, and that has now increased um, exponentially, so that uh, I don't know what the, the current precise Scottish figure is, but supposing it went from 5 to, say, 50% for argument's sake, um, simply having a university degree doesn't mean someone is guaranteed a higher income, surely, in the real economy. So I'm just wondering, is there been the wrong approach to education, technical training over the past 30 years in Scotland, which I think is also uh, a common theme with other countries as well. So it's not a development purely limited to, to Scotland by any means, but what, what comment would you have on that? I think, I think it's an interesting, it's a valid point. 
but the uh, the point I would the, the the counter argument to that would be that also the uh, the distribution of occupations and the type of jobs has changed in the last uh, 20 30 years as well so now we move on to from an industrial to a more uh, knowledge economy uh, so the figures that I have in my report suggest that you know the the number of uh, the percentage the share of managerial and um, sorry uh, of uh, professional occupations so the share of uh, professional occupations has almost uh, doubled in the last 10 years. So for, from 14%, it went uh, close to 25%. So the, 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 so the occupations, uh, the, uh, the distribution of occupations in the Scottish economy has changed as well. So, uh, so we, we, we shouldn't necessarily expect that because you have more higher educated individuals, the returns will go down because there are many people, the, uh, the uh, requirement have changed as well. The nature of jobs has changed as well. Right. Well, perhaps uh, I think Richard Marshall wanted to come in, but perhaps before we come to that, uh, Jamie Halcourt Johnson had uh, another issue. I think he wanted to come in on. Well, th thank you, Convener. One of the things I was going to talk about was the skills, which some of that's been covered. Um, I actually just wanted to go back very briefly to the, some of the comments that Richard Marsh um, made on identifying new sectors. Obviously, one of the um, key things in the Highlands and Islands region, which I represent, has been renewables and the opportunities that that's placed. Um, and you talked about. Um, Burnt Island fabrications and the um, number of uh, ports and, and, and harbours, you know, looking to that sector in, in that area. And obviously in the Highlands and Islands, that's uh, magnified again. I just wondered um, whether, um, you know, over the last number of years, there's been a lack of perhaps focus or coordination um, by government and by the agencies of government in terms of where, um, you know, the investment's been, uh, been made within particular sectors, uh, how, other how other countries um, coordinate or focus their efforts better, perhaps uh, identifying one or two um, uh, kind of key areas of expertise, uh, and, and also how we can, obviously looking forward, maybe do this, this better. I know that some of this has been covered, but it would just be interesting. Just before I, I go into that, it, it was the, the point I was going to make earlier was the question raised by Andrew Whiteman, which is, um, how would housing and costs affect economic growth? I actually thought it was a trick question. So I'd let the other macroeconomist answer first. But if you lower housing costs, it would, the economy would grow more quickly, simply because people have more money to spend. I mean, the only way, the, the only, I mean, if you put 20 economists in this room, 19, 20 of them would, would say the same thing. I think we're all agreed broadly on that point. The only people that talk about a healthy housing market with prices going up would be estate agents. And particularly for poor people where housing costs have risen more quickly, they, the, the poorest section of Scottish society tends to spend all the money they get. So actually, they kind of they multiply the knock-on effect in generating further economic activity. If they're able to spend more, would be greater. So I think everyone here has said pretty much the same thing. Um, in terms of your points, the, the, I think since, since devolution, we've had eight different economic strategies, plans, and frameworks. We've almost had a different economic plan every other year since devolution. We've had more economic plans than we have had Scotland managers since, since devolution. Um, <laughs> if we, if we, we've talked about um, different, focusing our efforts on different sectors. We've talked about, someone mentioned earlier, clusters. Um, the cluster approach used to be really popular in Scotland. That was what we used to base um, a lot of Scottish enterprise activities around. And we decided simply to move away from it. It's not that clusters have actually gone away. They're still there, but that's just not how we've chosen to approach it. If we think about the kind of changes that most of us have suggested here today in terms of additional childcare, in terms of having a look at um, city structures and so on, these are things that take 10, 20, 30 years to come through. We can't be in a position where we're changing the direction of travel for the strategic direction of economic development every second or third year. We have to kind of pick a way to go, keep it broad and talk about the broad trends we've highlighted earlier, but put our shoulder behind something and, and move forward. And the Highland is, and Highlands Island is probably an interesting area where you do have that kind of concerted effort so you do have a collective ambition to develop things more collaboratively. So I think probably things are done slightly better there than they are in other parts of Scotland. But, it, but again, in, ter in terms of the renewables, 
you have sites in the Highlands that will be competing with a number of different locations across Scotland, and there needs to be a choice there to say um, where do we focus our efforts. I mean, I think, I think, I think obviously with the Highlands, um, you will have parts of the Highlands competing with other parts of the Highlands, which is obviously, uh, again, part of the issue. And I think, interesting, um, um, when we talked about uh, decommissioning, because obviously there's a huge, uh, a, a huge opportunity there, but there are very few... Um, facilities in, uh, in, in the Highlands and Islands and in Scotland that are capable of dealing that. Why are we, why have we been bad at identifying or at least taking opportunities? Some of these things that would seem very obvious would seem something that we could actually, we could almost timescale in. Anyone? Does everyone agree on the housing point? Um, I saw some reaction to that from some of our guests um, but, sorry and we'll take a point of Gillian Martin yeah. at this point. I, I really feel as, as one of the conveners of the oil and gas cross party group I should point out that the majority of decommissioning actually happens offshore and we have not missed the boat on that we've actually been very active in that and actually the breakup of, of uh, installations onshore is a very small part of decommissioning so I wouldn't lose too much faith Right, and on, on the, um, if we have cheaper housing, the economy will grow point. Does anyone have any further comment to make on that from experts, Dr. Wilson and Professor Darby? So, so I would say the, having, keep, uh, we've, we've talked a couple of times about the fact that uh, if you look at the average figure that can go and hide what's happening through uh, uh, through the entire distribution. And I think the, the, the issue that is, coming up and has been uh, been brought up a, f uh, a few times is that there is a particular sector in the in of or in the economy that are being very adversely affected so in terms of 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 making cheaper housing uh, available for low income individuals seems to be an absolute priority because uh, they 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 a large proportion of their income will be going on housing costs. However, if you're saying, okay, well, all houses, like housing costs should be uh, reduced 20% across the board, people at the top end of the income distribution, well, that's just going to, like, that's not going to go and have that, that effect on them. So, uh, you know, targeting uh, low income um, you know, low income individuals, this will have an incredibly important impact on their lives. But um, there are many individuals where, um, if you make the, you know, if, if it were the case that household costs were reduced by, you know, even up to 20%, it's not going to go and mean that they'll, they'll just have higher savings or they'll find, uh, it's, it's my point. And Professor Darby. I certainly agree with Richard that, that the people who have least income will benefit having more disposable income from lower house, housing costs, and they are bound to spend more of that. They have very little ability to save on low incomes. It will get spent, so it will feed through to the economy. The people at the top end who benefit from higher house prices benefit through their wealth, their propensity to spend out of their wealth is much smaller than the low income people's propensity to spend out of their income. So absolutely, a macro, every macroeconomist would agree that there's going to be a spending effect from that. It might be low income people, it might be people in key jobs that you need to bring into places where accommodation is expensive. So the kind of key jobs arguments for subsidising housing for particular groups also is relevant. But high housing costs can certainly be a drag on growth. Um, Jackie Bailey. Um, I would simply observe that housing itself is a sector that contributes to the overall economy, so that there is probably a balance in there. Um, I wonder whether I could take a step back and just focus on something Richard Maas said, because I'm not sure there's maybe been eight strategies, but I, I defer to his ability to count. Um, but, but, but would it not be true to say that actually in all of those strategies, in all of those plans, they are largely the same at a high level. 
they are saying roughly the same thing. You know, we want the economy to grow, we want it to be inclusive, you know, and, and if you strip it apart, um, there is broad agreement on, on what we need to do. But actually, the bit that lies beneath it, the flexibility to spot opportunities and go after them and to do consistent things is may, maybe where we struggle. So, so my question is, is um, it, this, but in two parts, right? Does the, our economic strategy need to line up absolutely with other government policies and here are the two examples i would give you if we go for um, astonishing increases in productivity that's often at the expense of jobs and therefore we ignore inclusive growth so is the ambition to get productivity up in and of itself the right one and the second thing is um, we've signed up to a fiscal framework that actually focuses entirely on economic growth by way of increasing taxation as, as the fiscal measure. Um, it doesn't look at inclusive growth. So, so are we pulling in two very different directions, which at a strategic level is important for us if we're going to get this next, next piece of work right? That would be my first question, convener. Professor Montano. Yes, uh, on the the trade-off that you seem to suggest between productivity and jobs, uh, I would tend to disagree in the sense that productivity is an, 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 a necessary condition for growth, and growth is a necessary condition for the creation of jobs. Now, what may be happening is that if productivity growth is driven by new technology adoption, for example, there may be some displacement of, of work. But again, I would be uh, careful there in, in, in thinking that all technology adoption is necessarily bad for jobs, because first of all, there is what is known as uh, technology and, and skill complementarity. So, uh, the, the, a development in a certain direction may generate different jobs, okay? But then we go back to the issue of fairness in the, in the model of, uh, uh, you know, distribution that we have in society, because clearly, uh, you know, 10 years ago, everybody was talking about globalization. Now we talk about the fourth industrial revolution. The point is the same. There are dislocations which are happening and which are bound to happen in, in, with respect to certain segments of the labor markets. The only way to deal with those is to realize that they are happening and not to shift all the risk on those, uh, on those, uh, the economic risk on those segments of the labor market. So that's why it is important, again, to use a kind of holistic approach to policy. I, I don't think that productivity, we should be afraid of stimulating productivity in, in the fear that it may damage jobs. I think we should go for it, but then be aware that there are, um, you know, transitional periods which may require retraining, support, I don't know, I mean, the, the debate is open as to what, you know, some people talk about a universal basic income, some, some people talk about um, um, uh, public job being, jobs being guaranteed, guaranteed jobs or something, I mean, so these are all things which need to be explored. Um, uh, th there aren't easy answers, there, there are certainly very complex issues which require a joint thinking from all the stakeholders in society. Uh, well, I would agree with um, uh, Professor Montagna that uh, there isn't necessarily a trade-off, and there is no there are no clear winners or losers in this case because you know as as uh, Katya said, there's going to be there's bound to be some reallocation of of uh, of, uh, of the workforce, which is expected. But the, the, exactly because it's expected, the question then is, what do we do to facilitate that transition from one job to another? Uh, what are the mechanisms we, we put in place, place? What are the safety networks in terms of welfare? But also, what are the, uh, the proactive policies we can adopt in order to train them to make sure that you know, there's going to be a smooth transition to a new career pathway? Because there are uh, alternative career pathways. The question is how efficient the labor market is in identifying those uh, alternatives and making those transitions as smooth as possible. And this is related back to the issue of mismatch that sometimes it's been overlooked from the, uh, in the policy agenda. There is significant mismatch in the labor market and that's, you know, a mismatch is or how uh, good, <coughs> how well jobs are matched with uh, the individuals, with uh, the portfolio of skills that individuals has is a key uh, metric for how efficiently the labor market uh, is operating and it goes back to the issue of uh, productivity. So again, there can be policies in relation to that. So we can identify what are the issues in the labor market? How can we make the matching, the pairing between the worker and the, and the job as efficient as possible and make that match good? Because in Scotland, there is around 55, 56% of uh, uh, job mismatch, skills mismatch. 
So that's and that. Which we mean if a lot of them are actually people who are overeducated. Yeah. So yes. the you know the, the the investment in education that we have had hasn't translated into an increase in productivity. We need to understand why that is the case. Is it the case that people are acquiring the wrong type of skills, or is it the case that firms are not making the most of the skills that potentially they have at their disposal? And, and actually, the, the split there is, you know, around... By, by under-investing. The, there are more over-educated in Scotland than under-educated. Under and of course, that has implications for productivity. It has implications about... Um, uh, it has wage implications. There is a wage penalty. It has implications about uh, uh, job turnover. So it has lots of implications, both for the overall economy, but also for the movement of, uh, of the labour force across uh, jobs. Richard Marsh. Um, yes, yeah, so I was just uh, clarifying that there have been eight strategies, frameworks and plans. So going back to the framework for economic development in Scotland, part one, part two, recovery plans, government economic strategies and strategies for Scotland. Um, so uh, I suppose the point Jackie Bailey's made it, it is probably right in, in, in the sense that there is a core theme running through all the, um, through all the strategies. It places a lot of the heavy lifting on Scottish enterprise and the enterprise agencies, Highlands Islands as well. Um, but are they different? I think I think they matter because we've had on, on a regular basis a shift in emphasis. So, if you talk to public sector agencies in Scotland at the time that the government economic government economic strategy came out, they talked about gazifying their strategies. So they would take the government economic strategy gets and say, what are the buzzwords in it? What's it say? And simply go, right, that's our strategy done. So in some senses, you have, these things do matter because they come out and they say, uh, we want to be like the arc of prosperity countries. And here are the kind of characteristics displayed by those countries. And you put that out to the enterprise agencies and to local authorities and to the other agencies across Scotland. And they listen, they take it on board and they think, well, what does that mean for us? And if suddenly we say, actually, we didn't mean that, we're going in a different direction, that puts them in quite an awkward position because you're marching your men up the top of the hill and then tell them to go down the other side quite quickly. And it means you don't have that, those policies in place for that period of time over 10, 20 years broadly to make sure we're doing the right things for a long period of time so we know they work and work well or they don't work and we move on to something else. The point you made about the trade-off, I think I get what most of the other witnesses have said that one thing we tend to fall down on Scotland is is that we tend to look at policies um, quite narrowly so we tend to look at them in terms of will they grow the economy will they improve productivity will they uh, tackle inequality will they help the environment the the the, the discussion about the um, where to with air passenger duty is, is, is a good is a good example to say the Scottish government every year produces a carbon budget, which shows of all the different things it spends its money on, what's the impact on the economy and how much pollution is produced. Those figures clearly show that aviation outside of coal mining is possibly the worst trade-off you could ask for in terms of GDP per unit of pollution. When we have here d debated here in, in, in the parliament, what, what do we do? It's important to consider if you cut air passenger duty, would it boost the economy? Yes. Would it increase pollution? Yes. Does spending on airplane tickets account? Uh, is it probably to the benefit of more affluent households? Probably. So it's important to say, I wouldn't put it as, as, as boldly as, is it jobs or productivity or so on, but it, it's real choices to be made about the policies in front of us that might do some of the things that we want, but have quite significant side effects that, that we don't want. And we need a more open, evidence-based debate around that. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, <coughs> pardon me, in this session. So I, I don't know, was there a final follow-up, Jackie Bailey, that you wanted to? I'm happy to leave it there. There are points of detail, but I'm happy to leave it right. there. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much then to all of our witnesses uh, for coming in today. And I'll suspend the session at this stage. Thank you.
<clears throat> we'll resume session and may I welcome Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary for the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work and also the, those with them, uh, Graham Fisher, Stephanie Brown and Chris Kerr. Um, we're considering the uh, statutory instrument, Registers of Scotland. Um, let me get this one right. <laughs> We are considering first the Land Registration Etc. Scotland Act 2012 Amendment Order 2017 and thereafter moving on to the Registers of Scotland Digital Registration Etc. Regulations 2017. So we'll turn first of all to the Land Registration um, Instrument and I'll invite um, the Minister if he wishes to make a statement on this. To start with that. I will be very brief, Convener, uh, and if I can refer to both instruments at the same time, if that's okay. Uh, first of all, to thank the Committee for the chance to appear today and to answer questions about the instruments. Uh, members will be aware that the shorter order we'll be discussing makes two minor procedural amendments to the 2012 Land Registration Act. Uh, these amendments are procedural and intended to improve the process for registration of title of land. The Scottish Government's vision for delivering user-focused, collaborative, digital first public services is a key enabler to how Government will provide wide-ranging, easily accessible digital public services for the people of Scotland. So, Registers of Scotland are developing a range of digital services that will provide online delivery of land registration in a way that meets the needs of their customers and provides value to the people of Scotland. The draft regulations are designed to facilitate these new digital services and these signal another important step in Registers of Scotland digital transformation and its aim to become a fully digital business by 2020. The draft regulations provide a framework to support the eventual mandatory use of these digital services with a minimum six-month notice period applying and consultation with Scottish ministers being first required before such mandatory use can come into effect. And that will ensure and assist in ensuring that the Register of Scotland are delivering the most efficient and effective land registration services to the wider Scottish economy. They give effect to proposals set out in Registers of Scotland's consultation, Digital Transformation Next Steps, which sets out detailed proposals for changes to the land registration requirements to facilitate the introduction of new digital registration services, including a fully digital transfer of title service. The reaction to that consultation was very positive and respondents expressed strong support for the proposal to streamline and simplify the existing paper registration services. It's worth noting that the ROS Digital Discharge Service launched earlier this year has already proved popular with solicitors and lenders and has also considerably reduced the processing time for dealing with applications for discharges. And given that, I'm confident that the extension of these digital services will provide value for the people of Scotland. Uh, as the convener uh, mentioned, I'm joined by Stephanie Brown, Christopher Kerr uh, and Graham Fisher, uh, Graham Fisher from the uh, Scottish Government Legal Directorate, and we're happy to try and answer any questions uh, from the committee. Thank you. Um, thank you. Perhaps I could start with uh, a couple of questions, and this relates to the land registration order, and I think if just to cut uh, to the chase, um, the, reg the digital registration order, if I may refer to it as that, uh, has the effects you talk about, but Regulation 8 relates back to uh, the land registration order. So in the sense of Regulation 8 uh, relates to altering the land <coughs> register rules to reflect what will be in the um, land registration order. Okay, isn't it? I think I think people are nodding in agreement. Um, now, sorry, Graham Fisher. Convener, I was just going to to make the point that uh, the, the the regulation you refer to um, makes the change uh, in, uh, together with the, the change in the order, but one in relation to notification by the applicant for a prescriptive claimant, uh, and one by the um, by the keeper notification by the keeper. So they're two slightly different things, but they certainly work together. Yes. Well. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. The, the first question, the particular issue that I'm interested in with regard to land registration orders, the 60-day period being reduced to the seven-day period. And um, am I correct that there hasn't been consultation on that uh, aspect of things? 
No, there's not. And uh, the reason for that is that we think the change is a, a minor and procedural one, as I mentioned. Um, and I think there's also substantial safeguards in place uh, in addition to that. So the 60-day um, period can be uh, far longer than is necessary if those have been given notice have already responded to say they have no objection. It's also true that further into the process, both the Keeper and the Queen's QLTR, if I can refer to that, Tim, that acronym, um, also are able to make checks on an application. So we think there are sufficient safeguards and the change is sufficiently minor and procedural uh, not to have had a consultation on that specific issue. Might I, I just refer back to when there, there was a consultation on the Land Registration um, Scotland Act 2012, and I think uh, those with you will be familiar with this. Uh, the compilation of the responses to that <clears throat> was issued in March 2014. And just looking at that uh, consultation report on the 2012 Act and looking at questions 42 and 43 and what that says about them, and this related to the prescriptive claimant and the 60-day notice period, um, what is said there is the period should be 60 days, then it says respondents to that consultation, so this is in 2013-2014, including the QLTR, the Council of Mortgage Lenders, Faculty of Advocates, overwhelmingly agreed with the proposal that 60 days is an appropriate period. The Keeper will therefore include policy to this effect in draft regulations to be considered by the Scottish Ministers. So clearly, when it was consulted on, the 60-day period was considered by the consultees to be the appropriate period of time. So uh, do you understand that certainly I, and I think other members of the committee, have concern about that period being altered now without consultation? I think uh, I do understand that, Convener. I would say that, uh, first of all, this is a much reduced, um, with the digitisation of the records which are there, a much reduced number that's involved. And as I understand it, there's substantial support from the legal fraternity uh, for the change. But perhaps those that were actually involved in 2012 might want to comment on that. I think, yeah, if we could, thank you, Convener. Uh, the reason for the 60-day period was really to give people who were notified by a potential prescriptive claimant sufficient time to check their title deeds, to ch take legal advice before responding. The change which is being proposed is only applicable in cases where the party has already done that and has responded to the prescriptive claimant to say that they have no objection. And you think that, I think in the, this new scenario, a 14-day turnaround period would be what could potentially apply to dealing with these issues? Do you think that is sufficient to allow people to respond, react, deal with these issues? I think it w if they need longer, they st the 60-day period still is there. So they can take 60 days if they feel that they need 60 days. The period will be shortened where they have reached a conclusion within that 60-day period and responded to say that they don't have any objections. And, and what about others who might be affected by this, who are not aware of what is going on, who haven't been notified? So again, our view on that is that, that there are three levels of, of, of check on that, if you like. So the first is that the applicant must satisfy that they have notified everyone who appears to have an interest under paragraphs A and B, um, paragraph C where the notification to the QLTR takes place. In cases where notification does go to the QLTR, the QLTR must also satisfy themselves that the applicant hasn't missed anyone. And then the third stage, the keeper does the same. So the keeper will check that no one who should have been notified has failed to be notified. In cases where anyone who appears from the history of the title should have been notified has not been notified, then the application would be rejected and, the, and the, they would be back to the start of the process. And in the cases where multiple parties are notified, each one of them would have to say that they were uh, content or didn't object before the 60-day period would be reduced. Perhaps uh, Andy Whiteman would like to come in at this point. Oh, a few questions on this um, order. Um, the prescriptive elements of it, the changes are contained in both orders that we're considering today. I'm just wondering why, I mean, I understand that in the digital one, um, that's about applications and therefore the changes to prescriptive claimants at the application stage could probably more logically be in there, whereas the, the keepers job in this could be another one, but it, it makes it a little bit different, difficult to um, consider because basically they're both dealing with the same policy questions. I just wonder why they were put in two different orders. It's purely for technical reasons. It's not possible, unfortunately, to, to combine orders and regulations just just purely in, in terms of the, the, the 
in interpretation and legislative reform act it doesn't uh, it doesn't accommodate date that unfortunately or we would certainly have done it that way that's a fantastic answer thank you very much that, that precisely answers my question um where did on the prescriptive claimants question where did the initiative come from this to make this change who who thought it was a good idea where did this start was, if I may, convener, it was first um, observed by Registered Scotland operational staff dealing with these applications in conjunction with the parties making the application. So the parties making the application found it difficult to understand why there was a standstill period when everyone who had an interest had indicated there was no objection. Since then, they have been discussed with the Law Society of Scotland, um, who also don't, had no objection to the change proposed. It's also true they have uh, Scotland have an obligation, um, I think, under the previous Act to maintain a, a constant review of the services they provide and to improve them. So it would have been under that kind of standing um, injunction that they would have looked at this. Well, on the substantive policy question, obviously the 2012 Act uh, makes changes to prescription, which I think are broadly welcomed in terms of tightening uh, everything up. Uh, nevertheless, it's still a, an area of, of contention in terms of policy. Um, and one of the problems, of course, in all of this is that the, the applicant um, and the keeper both have responsibilities to make reasonable inquiries, let's put it that way, within timescales. But anyone who has not been asked by either of those parties uh, may have an interest in this. Uh, there's no guarantee that either the applicant or the keeper will have a full knowledge of the potential parties that may have a claim to the land. And so one of the reasons for having a, a 60 day period, albeit it's on the back of a, a year's uncontested possession, is to allow other voices to come out of the woodwork. And so in that regard, I'm a little bit unclear about why one would want to reduce this period, given that was part of the original safeguards. And I take the point that Chris Kerr made in response to the convener's question, of course, that this is just in those uncontested cases. But part of the, that period of time is for people who haven't been consulted at all to sort of as a, as a last gasp option to sort of put their hand up and say, well, what about me? I think, as we said earlier on, there, there are further checks through the QLTR and through the Keeper subsequently to try and make sure that everybody that should have been notified was notified. And of course, you're right to say you have the, the years period beforehand, but there's also a further 10-year period after that when mm -hmm. objections can come forward, challenges can come forward to that. And I'd also make the point that this refers to a reducing number, uh, and it's only those which those who have been uh, notified have raised no objection to, but it's a reducing number of these cases in the first place. So we think um, that's a proportionate response uh, to that. And if over the course of that 10-year period, as I say, somebody feels that they should have been consulted or notified that wasn't, then they do have the chance to come forward. It's not a, a done deal as soon as this is carried out. I don't be right. But, but anyone coming forward in that 10-year period is coming forward afresh a with a, mm. a, a, a title that's already been recorded and has precedence over their title if there's broad equivalence in the claim. If it's, I understand that ownership is not achieved until that 10-year period has passed, so that's it can right. still be challenged. Yeah. I think we, we think it's proportionate those, with those checks and given the number of cases there are, different levels of checks, we think that's a proportionate um, position to take in relation to the risk. So, so, so the motivation for this change in the prescriptive um, uh, provisions, which are contained in the two bits of legislation, came from a relatively small number of people who said, why do we have to wait another 40 or 50 days? It did come from a relatively small number of people, but these applications themselves are relatively small. Since the since the uh, 2012 Act came into force in December 2014, there have been 17 successful applications for prescriptive claimants. So the headline numbers are small, therefore the number of people affected are also small. And th that's a relatively small number of people who are the people that are involved in this, pro most involved in this process. But it has, to, it has been something that's been supported by others that are involved, not from Register of Scotland, but um, that interact with the process. They've supported it. The idea of having to wait that extra 40 or 50 days when they know that everyone that's been notified has already said they have no objection, it makes it more efficient. Um, and with the safeguards I've mentioned, we think that's a, 
a proportionate way to do it. We are trying through uh, digitisation to improve and make more efficient the service. I think there's a quote somewhere that says that nothing today is, uh, nothing is, or we move faster in these things than we've ever done before, and we're going to move, uh, we're never going to move as slowly again. So it is a progression to try and, not just for the sake of it, but it seems to me to be just um, an efficient way to go about doing this. And if there's a 50 day period, um, that's not being used when everybody that's been notified has said they have no objection and it seems to me an efficient way to go about things. And it would naturally occur, I would imagine, to those most involved in the process to, to um, see the need for a change. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other questions? Jackie Bailey. Convener, just so that I understand this correctly, if a relevant person is notified and they say they don't object, the keeper then notifies them because it's uncontested and they then have seven days. They could change their mind. Is seven days enough for them to then, you know, instruct somebody, a lawyer or whatever, to, to, to do this? So, so we think that it is. Uh, the process is, is uh, no more than saying to the keeper that they object. They don't have to justify it. They don't have to go into detail. They've, when they've taken the decision in the first place, they've at that stage already taken sufficient legal advice. They know the title position. If they change their mind in response to the keeper's notification, all they have to do is say, and now that I, I now object, and it's a very straightforward process. They shouldn't require any additional legal advice at that stage if they've just come to a different conclusion. Okay, what if in, in the situation where there are per, perhaps rival prescriptive claimants, so say the local community might have an interest, um, obviously that period of seven days um, is very short in which to be able to both notify people and allow them to come back in and lodge an alternative claim. So I would suggest there can, there can really only be one prescriptive application at a time because of the year's possession requirement. So you can't have multiple parties in possession at the same time. Unless they're proceeding to, unless they're looking to take title jointly between them in common, so you can't really have competing applications in that way. Okay. Thanks, convener. It was a slightly different issue on the more on the um, digital regulations. Um, I think the convener wrote to you on the seventh um, of November, and you replied on the tenth. Um, and that was particularly about the kind of a uh, trial that's been going on. I think up till October. 2017, and it said that uh, almost 8% of all discharges received by Register of Scotland were submitted via the service. You go on to say that 81% of respondents rating it as satisfactory or very satisfactory, which I suppose raises the question as to what did the other 19% think. Were there any particular concerns that the other 19% kind of had? Um, the 19% responded to say that they were neither satisfied nor dissatisfied with the service. Within the survey, we had two further functions which were dissatisfied and very dissatisfied, neither of which were selected by any of the respondents. Right. That feedback forms one element of the activity and engagement that we undertake with our customers. We also have direct engagement as well. Um, since our service has gone live, we've attended 57 events, um, spoken at 14 of those, had stands at 21 events, all with the aim of reaching as many of our users as possible to try and find the types of service that would be of value to them. For this one in particular, we've recently introduced some additional functionality and we actually have a change that takes effect on Thursday of this week and that's in direct response to customers' feedback. They would like a dashboard function so they can control their work from within the service and the latest feature of that dashboard will be available to them on Thursday. Okay, thanks. And, I mean, the registers, we are expecting them to do quite a lot at the moment because this, uh, the idea of uh, the land register by 2024 is obviously a major target. We're not kind of overloading them at all, are we? Well, given that this initiative has come, as we've heard in response to the question, uh, questions from Mandy Whiteman, is an initiative of registers, then I, I don't think so. And having visited um, the office, it's a big challenge, as you say, land registration by 2024. But this... I think they would see would help with the workload rather than hinder it. Okay, thank you. Right, if there, if there are no more questions, then I'll move to the formal debate on the motion. Uh, does any member wish to speak in the debate? Andy Whiteman. Yes, thank you, convener. Th uh, uh, thank you, convener. Um, to my mind, that the burden of proof on changing the law is always with those making this uh, suggestion. Um, 
there's been no consultation on the prescriptive claimants um, provisions and given the um, controversial nature of prescriptive claimants in any event I'm nervous that there may be unforeseen consequences here. I'm not entirely sat happy with the notion of changing uh, the law relating to time frames on the basis of a very small number um, of cases. Um, I, I don't doubt that this may be a valid uh, change to the uh, timetable. I, I don't doubt that may be the case. Um, I just don't think the case has been made in the wider context um, as to the potential risks this throws up. I think the prescriptive uh, provisions that were put in the 2012 Act are a significant enhancement on what went before. I've absolutely no doubt about that, whatever. But I'm nervous about interfering with them at this stage on the back of what appears to be um, comments from people who just want things to go a little bit faster. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm not minded to support those provisions. And because, uh, as Mr Fisher identified, the prescriptive position provisions are contained within both bits of legislation we're considering today for um, legal reasons, there, there have, they have to be. Um, that means I'm not minded to support either uh, instrument. But I have to say that the, the other measures uh, in the... Um, in the um, in the uh, land registration um, amendment order um, are not objectionable and um, the whole of the rest of the digital one is not objectionable either. Yes, uh, perhaps I could go back a stage because in fact uh, my, my mistake, uh, Cabinet Secretary, I should have asked if you wish to move the motion before then inviting Mr Whiteman or anyone else to speak in the debate. So I suppose the first question is whether, whether you wish to move the motion. I would formally move the motion to convene, yeah. Well, we'll take Andy Whiteman's comments as being in, part, in the debate. Does anyone else wish to speak in the debate? John Mason. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I mean, I do have some sympathy with uh, what Andy Whiteman's saying, um, and, I mean, especially if there was going to be any disadvantage for the community who might take a bit of time to get moving, and seven days just seems on the surface to be quite tight. On the other hand, I think I'm reassured that if it's 17 applications since 2014, we are talking a pretty tiny number of issues. And if there's not been a lot of problems since 2014, um, and that if these 60 days haven't really been required on a regular basis, uh, I think I'm a bit more relaxed about it. But maybe the Cabinet Secretary could just kind of reassure us about that the communities are not going to be disadvantaged. And then, before I give the Cabinet Secretary a chance to respond, um, I think, having heard what has been said, my concern would remain that uh, 60 days being reduced to seven reduces this to a, a short period, which um, I think those with experience of dealing with the registers or for the registers themselves is an extremely tight turnaround time. And I'm not sure that uh, I've been persuaded by what has been put forward in terms of this being put forward in terms of efficiency, because I don't see, when we're talking about 10-year prescriptive periods and so forth, that uh, the difference between 60 days and seven is that material when it comes to efficiencies. But I'll allow the, the cab sec to respond. Hey, thank you, Convener. On the point about seven days, I should say that seven-day period only kicks in after people have had the chance to object, but I've said that they'd have no objection to this. So that seven days is an additional protection in relation to that, um, which I think would meet some of the concerns uh, expressed um, uh, by at least uh, Mr Mason. Um, and I think also the points I've made about the protections which are in place, first of all, this will go through often the QLTR, it will go through the Keeper, who's an objective um, judge of whether the right people have been notified at that stage. And in addition to that, you have the subsequent 10-year period, where, of course, it be can become evident, if that was the case, uh, that somebody that wasn't notified um, hadn't been notified. So I think those layers of protection for what are not just a very small number, but a receding number as digitisation progresses, this number becomes less and less. I think it's a very proportionate way in which to try and ensure there is increased efficiency. We are regularly and rightly enjoined to increase efficiency in public services. 
not at the expense of people's rights, and I don't believe this does infringe on people's rights. So I think for those reasons, the protections which are in place, the fact that nobody's going to be um, confronted with a seven-day period in isolation, only those that have already actually made known their views already. I do think this is a proportionate way to go about improving and making more efficient uh, public services. Um, thank you very much. Right, we'll simply move to the vote then on the question is that motion S5M08842 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, we'll have a division then. So all those in favour, uh, please raise their hand. All those against, please raise their hand. Um, the result is four votes in favour and five votes not in favour. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore disagreed to. Yes. Um, thank you very much. We'll move on then to the, uh, since the minister has already, or the, sorry, the cabinet secretary, apologies, I keep calling you the minister. The cabinet secretary has already spoken on the uh, second order that we were uh, considering here. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary intend to move uh, that motion on that order? Yes, I'd formally move. Formally moved. Um, are we agreed to that uh, order? Sorry, I'll, I'll, put the, I'll put the technical terms of the motion. The question is that motion S5M08844 be agreed to. Uh, sorry, Mr. Whiteman has correctly pointed out that we the motion has been moved, therefore we move to the debate. Does anyone wish to speak in the debate? Mr. Whiteman. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, I very much welcome these regulations. I think digitisation is the, is the future, um, notwithstanding some of the problems that have been in the public sector with digital projects. Um, I think it helps speed things up and it provides better quality information to everybody who uses uh, public sources of information like uh, the Registers of Scotland. Um, so I'm very content with these new regulations. My, my problem is that um, for legal drafting reasons, there is a section eight and it relates to the prescriptive claimants, which as I indicated in the previous debate on the previous order, I'm not convinced that a case, a sufficient case has been made uh, to change the law. Again, maybe perfectly innocent, but I, I, I don't see that case, and I, I'm concerned about unforeseen consequences. So um, I'm minded not to support this, but, but only because of, uh, of Section 8. Yes, I, I could perhaps add that is my only concern uh, as well, and perhaps a further concern is that, I think as has been indicated, the reason this has been put in the same instrument is for technical reasons rather than um, one being able to separate the things out, which would have uh, resulted in a, perhaps a different approach to matters. Does the Cabinet Secretary wish to respond to that? No, I think I made the argument similar on Camina. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, in that case, uh, the question is that motion S5M08844 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, there is a division, so we'll move to a vote. Can all those in favour raise their hands? And all those not in favour raise their hand. The result again is four votes in favour, five votes not in favour, and there were zero abstentions. The most motion is therefore disagreed to. Um, uh, accordingly, I'll thank the Cabinet Secretary and those who have come with him and suspend the meeting and move to private session. Thank you.